Welcome to Geordie Lass and Doc Sass. One day, a Geordie and a Canadian walk into a bar and decide to start a podcast about relationships and what a topic that is. No subjects are off limits. Get in touch today with us at geordielass.com or email info at geordielass.com and let us know what you think and what we should talk about. Welcome to the podcast. Hello and welcome. <laughs> Sorry about my voice, Hello. everybody. <laughs> Anna sounds very husky and sexy. She's doing the late night edition this week. Oh my God, I'm doing the late night edition. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, what happened, baby? What happened? Jeez. Oh, well, I think I caught a little virus. I'm back in Toronto. Hey. Um, <laughs> and I caught a little virus um, in my final days in Athens and uh, just went to my vocal cords and because I talk all day, <laughs> yeah, kind of for a living, but also for uh, <laughs> just because I'm a loudmouth, <laughs> uh, I haven't been able to have vocal rest. So uh, it's going to be sexy times after dark uh, for this podcast episode. <laughs> <laughs> Something to look forward to, listeners. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm looking for multiple income streams, so maybe I could sort of like put my voice to good use. I... This is your audition tape. <laughs> <laughs> totally is. Totally is. So how have you been and how have your travels been? We've both been traveling the planet. We have been. It feels like a little while. We had a little break from recording so we could both do our respective traveling. So yeah, I've had a great time actually. Um, had a few days in the UK, which is always nice to be on the hustle and bustle of UK life after um, after island life, which is pretty much the same thing most days. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, you got it. So yeah, it's nice. It was nice to be. I love being in kind of airports. Like I'm oh, quite sad like that. Yes. I just love kind of being in an airport, seeing so many yes. different people, wondering where they're all going, what they're doing, observing the patterns of behavior that go on between people in an airport, I think oh. is fascinating. <laughs> oh, those patterns are so funny. <laughs> well, what is the funniest pattern that you see? Like, do you look at couples and the way that they're interacting in airports? Yeah, I love to, I love to watch that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, And I also noticed there was a high volume of people um, who were having champagne at breakfast time in the airport. <laughs> uh-huh. What do you think that says about the stress <laughs> levels? <laughs> oh, yeah, quite indeed. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So yeah, no, it was good. It was nice to get away, be somewhere different. And then um, from the UK, we then, so after a few days in the UK, we then went to Cape Verde or Cap Verde, as um, others would pronounce it. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. So yeah, it was good. It was nice. I feel like we were well looked after and um, yeah, very hospitable, uh, really nice food, uh, amazing weather. It's just oh. nice to have some sunshine. Ah, oh. ah. Oh. Now, has it like has it been spring crazy, rain insanity in Jersey, or has it been really nice? Have, no, did I you don't need know what's going on. Seriously, I've come back; it's absolutely bloody freezing. Oh shit! <laughs> I just I'm ready for the summer, girl. I'm ready for it. You I know, know we're talking about the weather on this podcast. And I know we do. I think at some stage, we'll end up being reclassified from relationship to weather reports <laughs> to meteorological <laughs> reports. I know. So yeah, we have to stop talking about the weather. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have to say, like, Athens was surprisingly and unseasonably cold pretty much the whole month of uh, April, May. Wow. Yeah, which is good. It's fine. It was still gorgeous. Like, everything is, like, I swam in the Aegean, even though it was cold as F. Oh, wow. Uh, because, th hey, that's what a Canadian does when they're on the Aegean. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the temperature is, you, you're going in. Um, but, yeah, no, I mean, it has been really surprising. Mm. Uh, so Cape Verde must yeah. have been just this beautiful, warm... Oh, it was Bath. lovely. It was like 29 oh. degrees, but there was a, there was a consistent wind the whole time. Um, but it wasn't enough to fully take the edge off. You still kind of felt, you know, warm enough. So it was lovely. Perfect. Oh, beautiful. I'm already trying to work out if we can go back again. Well, there's that thing of hopefully 5 million pounds just lands up on your doorstep, <laughs> right? We're still waiting. We're still I'm waiting. still trying to manifest it. Although the weirdest thing, away for almost two weeks, not a single bit of post. I can't get over it. I'm what? like, somebody's stealing Something's our post. Wrong. I swear to God, there's yes. no way we could have two weeks without any post. I don't get it. No bills? Nothing. Not possible. It's there's not something possible, going is on. it? It is yeah. not possible. So, not possible. come on, mail, where are you? Turn up and please, please enclose that very large check. Yes. 
I, I was thinking about you. I was on my paddleboard two days ago, my first paddle back on the lake here in Toronto. And uh, I found myself looking in the water for plastic bags full of rolls of bills because <laughs> there's a border on the lake between the U.S. and Canada. And I keep waiting for drug money to come up. <laughs> and I was thinking, I swear to no word of a lie. I was like, what if I found like $300,000 in a plastic bag floating in Lake Ontario would I tell anybody or would I stuff it under my mattress and just use cash? And I was thinking about you because I was like, I also am looking for my landfall win, but I'm See? looking on Lake Ontario for yeah, yeah. drug money. Maybe, that, maybe that's what I need to do. Right. <laughs> Go and look in a few hedges. Hope in the, the best. English Channel, there's got to be some drug money floating <laughs> in there. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm hoping that mine comes from some sort of, um, you know, less ethically moral <laughs> um, ethically ways, dubious we, sources yeah 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 <laughs> wonderful <laughs> i'll have more moral money please <laughs> oh i don't really mind if it's unmarked bills i'm fine <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love i'll spend it. it slowly without uh, attracting the uh, attention of the authorities <laughs> of course now that i put it on a podcast i'm like oh crap i kind of yes, ruined my cover <laughs> you're screwed now yeah <laughs> screwed now <laughs> So, okay, so the relationship desk of love, literally the desk was being exchanged. Are the you desk, on a new desk has been exchanged. We have oh. a new desk of love. Oh my God, tell me everything. How is it? Because it was quite the wait for this beautiful desk. It was quite a wait for the beautiful desk. I then started to put together the desk <laughs> and everything was going really, really great. And I was thinking, because you had to actually build the desk. And I was thinking, this is amazing. God, this is going so well. Until, <laughs> until I tried to put a, the top on or the side or some bit, connect some bit to another bit and realized there's no way that this is right. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> so I think I had to screw and unscrew the desk about three times before I got there. But I got oh. there and I did not give up. And so now the love desk is fully functioning. And it's sturdy. No wobble. It's very sturdy. <laughs> It was touch and go for a while, though. <laughs> <laughs> like all relationships are. Oh, absolutely. But you keep working on them and they get yes. sturdier and stronger. Yes. Oh, yes. beautiful. Stay committed. <gasps> nice. Good segue. Okay, well, tell me, <laughs> Miss Relationship Correspondent, what's going on at the new love desk? The new love desk. Well, you know, I like a phrase that we don't kind of know and, and I kind of think, oh, what's that? Mm -hmm. So I came across an article. And it says, and you, you're going to think when I read out the title, what has that got to do with relationship, Sarah? But bear with me, okay? So the title of the article is Swedish Death Cleaning Can Improve Your Life Right Now. What is going on? <laughs> okay, I have no idea what this is about. Tell me. <laughs> She's like, have we jumped onto a different podcast? Wait a minute, are we week? in the Matrix? What's going on? <laughs> So it says it's meant to make things easier for your loved ones after you die. Hence connection. But it can help you beforehand too. Okay. So this phenomena is all about, somebody's written a, a book about it. It's a whole thing. And it's all about clearing stuff out so that when eventually all of us are going to pass at some stage. And at the point that you do, you're... All of the crap and collection of clutter that you have gathered. And I am speaking to somebody who lives with somebody now who <laughs> collects crap and clutter. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> yep. All of that is left behind for your loved ones. So whether that's your spouse or your um, children, generally, it's often the case, to sort out. So it says we should start at about 65 we should start to plan to reduce the things that we've got in terms of physical things and be able to let go of them. We need to be able to mentally and emotionally shift things that are no longer creating a positive energy in our lives. And we need to be able to clear them. And this practice is known as Swedish death cleaning. Oh my gosh. Okay. Because I'm aware of Marie Kondo's um, decluttering protocols. <laughs> there are things around to bring you joy. The funniest, most hilarious article I read, which was a follow up to that, was after she had her third child, she gave up. Oh, <laughs> she really? Was just like, I can no longer. 
I can no longer keep this house free of clutter. Oh, <laughs> isn't that interesting? <laughs> there was a big massive article about it saying that's it, I'm kind of done now. So everything that you've been practicing breaching for years has now suddenly tipped over the edge after she had her third child. Oh. Appa- apparently, anyway. That as per Parents the everywhere must be smugly going, see? <laughs> Oh, there was a lot. I'm sure there were a lot of people clapping their hands at that. Yeah, totally. <laughs> not totally. in a bad way, but just no. in a. You see, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. So yeah, so this book basically says, um, well, the article about the book says, um, at a certain point in your life, you um, you should stop accumulate, accumulating more stuff and start to deal with the stuff that you've already gathered, so that your loved ones don't have to do it after you've gone. Uh, So instead of leaving enormous chores behind for the future, you can make it a thoughtful project now while you're still in control. So it says technically you're supposed to engage in Swedish death cleaning. I just can't get over the title. Um, (laughs) Later in life. And it's recommended that you start at 65. But actually any age is Mm. a good age to start. And you don't necessarily need to wait until then. You should start to make this a bit of a project and a bit of a priority now and take control of things. Mm. And, you know, because I'm, I like thinking about death. I like thinking about (laughs) the quality of our days rather than the length of our days. And I think there is no time too soon to be able to prioritize experiences and people and relationships Mm. over stuff for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's so sobering to think, um, you know, I guess people in my family have had to clear out, you know, one of my aunts is going into long-term care mm. and has been quite a hoarder. And the, the toll it has taken on some of my family members to clear out her apartment yeah. was unprecedented. Um, yeah. It is it is really tough, right? Yeah. So um, when, when we were in COVID, when COVID first start, started to happen and we heard all of these like horrific stories right in the beginning before we even knew that kind of humanity was going to survive and we heard about people who were in kind of space suits trying to look after loved ones that were so sick and so poorly who were who were quite relatively young as well I went through this this period of having to try and clear out all my cupboards because oh I was terrified I was going to die and the kids were going to have to sort out my crap oh yeah but it is a really kind of sobering thought, isn't it? You know, if somebody said to you, well, you know, you've only got kind of so long to live, then the thought of somebody else having to kind of deal with all that or you trying to deal with that and prepare for that along with everything else at the same time would just be too overwhelming, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. So it does make sense, really, that you start to address some of these things early. I, it's funny, I had a conversation, not about the death side of it, but if the... Um, around generally kind of you know clearing things out because it does give you kind of negative energy when you're surrounded by too much clutter I find it really overwhelming I can't kind of cope with it um, and so we're having a conversation with a friend of mine and she has a real problem where it's just kind of moving things from room to room bit of a kind of jigsaw puzzle trying to organize things and never quite getting there because then somebody will come to stay and she has to almost kind of start the process again and I said to her um because a lot of it is you can't let go of stuff, right? So whether yeah. that's because you think you've spent money on it, it's kind of like a big thing, um, particularly with kind of clothes and stuff. It's like, well, I've, you know, I've spent a fortune on these. I need to keep them like, and I know I go through it. God, I've got far too many clothes. And, you know, some of it is emotional attachment. Some of it is, well, you know, maybe there's a use for this. Some of it is we just don't want to waste things. So we have all of these kind of, stories and this mindset and and it comes with quite a lot of kind of heavy internal baggage as well as the creation of external baggage as well but our conversation on the other night was imagine if you were going to emigrate or retire somewhere and you could only take kind of a handful of things with you so you're moving overseas you're clearly not going to take kind of all of your possessions with you so what would be the most important things and what could you just let go of oof well, I kind of actually feel like that's quite topical in my life right now and something that I'm thinking about, um, mm. which is the very real, like, what would you sell? Yeah. Um, what would be worth shipping overseas or, or yeah. spending money to have a storage unit versus selling stuff? Yeah. Uh, it's a very real, and it puts everything into good context. Yeah. And I think, you know, like putting things into storage, it's a bit like putting things in the in the loft, isn't it? Or the garage or the attic like all you're doing is kind of storing that problem for another day but what 
what is it that would have to happen for you to do something with that so if you put something into storage you're obviously doing it for a reason so what what's mm-hmm. that reason and uh, how long does that reason last because I think that can really help to put a finite point on it hmm. so you've got it so yeah but I think that whole thing about your family having to deal with it mm. after you've gone because your clutter is one thing right like we can all kind of at some stage when we're ready and in the right mindset we can all kind of you know face the the stuff that we've kind of buried but if it's somebody else's then is that is that fair is that is that justified oh it's a beautiful thought it makes us extremely and immediately self-conscious about these decisions (laughs) yeah you're not just making decisions for you yeah exactly and when your kids are judging you when they're going through (laughs) stuff going (laughs) what the fuck (laughs) i know i know well, it's funny because my, my grandmother, a huge hoarder, she used to save coffee tins, oh. hundreds of coffee tins. And that's a WTF, like what coffee yes. tins? How is that? But again, that's also war mentality, right? She lived through oh, World yeah. War II in, in, yeah. uh, in Cardiff. Totally. Yeah. So yeah, there's all kinds of reasons for it. And they're all kind of justified and valid in your own mind, um, for sure. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Swedish death cleaning. I love it. <laughs> I just love it when you come across an article that's like, what does that mean? I, I need it. to know more about this. <laughs> <laughs> need to Google oh. that for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> nice. Okay. All right. Shall we um, skip to the... What's the name? <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> Let's skip to the hot topic. Let's like, do it. Oh, that's next? where we're going. Yes, you've okay. got it. Hot topic it is. God, I, I think I'm losing my mind. Honestly, I really am. Is this is this what life has become now? Maybe is we are. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think we're just kind of like in a swirl and it's spring and it's it's all a bit confusing and you just got back from your trip and they're yeah. working on hard things and it's just our focus is a little bit off. And that's okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, Anna. It's okay. <laughs> okay all right so hot topic let's get back on it let's on it today's hot topic how to get your needs met (sighs) yes yes Mm. yes yes. okay yes this i think this topic is kind of the fundamental basis for a lot of um disagreements upset conflict in relationships because when it comes down to it, often when we pick apart a conflict situation, it's, I feel like this should be happening, you didn't do it, I'm annoyed. And on the other side, it's, well, actually, I feel like this should be happening, and you didn't do it, and I'm annoyed. And then we end up in this kind of impasse, this stalemate situation, this kind of shut down, this emotional barrier that comes up, and then we kind of get the withdrawal, and then trying to get the kind of the white flag and the truce to be called. Who's going to give in first? And it all comes down to needs, I swear. it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I myself love communicating my needs through passive aggressiveness. <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite. I thought you were going to come out with something that was quite smug. Like I myself am very good at communicating my own needs. <laughs> nope. <laughs> No, I like the good old like throwing a tantrum, stonewalling, being silent, yeah. playing the guess what I'm thinking game. Like, I'm mad at you, but I'm not going to tell you why. Yes. <laughs> I love it. That old classic. That old chestnut. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, no, yeah. don't do me. And I'm also trying to rehabilitate <laughs> myself by being able to, when I notice myself being triggered as when anger mm. is coming up, frustration, hurt, shut yeah. down, then yeah. I say, Anna, you're being hurt. Your, your need is not being met. Yeah. What's that need? Oh, it's this. So what was your expectation? Oh, that he would just guess it. I'm like, Anna, yeah. what happens with a guess what I'm thinking game? And I'm like, oh, yeah, it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> okay, so how are we going to start to put words behind our need? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Okay, so it's getting true. our needs met. Yeah, so. Yeah. yeah. So I think there you highlighted kind of quite a number of things that show up and manifest and how we patterns of behavior that we end up slipping into or kind of feelings and emotions that come up for us they're all kind of real tales that's you know 
some sort of saying that something's not right and and that, that we've got needs there that aren't being met and I, but here's the thing right not all me needs have to be met by your partner hmm. oh, so I think ah, we, that's huge I know so we'll go with this expectation that I, you know I've got a problem um this is what I would like to happen in order for me to feel okay and comfortable in that situation hmm. okay so what's your what's your process if we were just sort of like well not maybe not your process but the ideal process if we were just sort of mm. break it down what does it look like what's the what's kind of the staging and process we should go through yeah so I think you've mentioned a few things there as well in terms of what you're experiencing and how you kind of start to the, the first thing is really that awareness so let's stop let's notice that there's something going on mm. so as soon as we start to feel some of those more negative sides of behavior come out mm. so the kind of you know I'm, I'm starting to feel a bit irrational I'm starting to feel quite emotional you can feel it in your body as well you can almost feel it I always kind of depict those cartoons where you know like Tom and Jerry where you would kind of get whacked over the head and you'd start to see the blood kind of rising up and they show you the kind of levels of red increasing and um, throughout the body that almost happens to you in those situations you can almost mm. feel the kind of the anger and the frustration and the hurt and the emotion kind of rising up now the more we can get used to spotting that sign then the more we can start to notice that there's something happening mm. and that is honestly the first stage and and it's quite hard to master that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My gosh. And it takes practice. So, you know, we talk about intuition is kind of a muscle and we need to flex it. We need to give it a good workout in the gym. And this oh, yeah. kind of, um, you know, emotional awareness, emotional intelligence is also something that we need to get out there and kind of work at and flex and to be able to notice them. I've had a few moments recently of kind of intuition that I, I noticed it, I spotted it and I still ignored it. And then afterwards, I was like, why did I ignore that then? I knew there was something wrong. Why didn't I do something about it? But sometimes there's something that's overriding that makes you plow on regardless. And then afterwards, you go, well, that was a bit stupid. Uh, uh. So sometimes as well, we can notice these things and spot them, but do nothing about it. And, be, you know, because of a variety of reasons and then kind of, but all of it by even just acknowledging that, that I spotted something and I didn't do anything about it will still help us to kind of grow and to flex um, that muscle within. Yeah, you've got it. And and it is curious to ask yourself, why did I notice and I went on anyway? Some of it is because, yeah. well, I'm used to a pattern. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sometimes it's because of self-sabotage. Yeah. We want to kind of crash the car into the cliff. Yeah, absolutely. There's all kind of number of reasons why we can ignore some of these things. Well, and I think too is like, and there's a deep fear of actually noticing that a need is coming up that it's not being met mm -hmm. noticing the reaction to it um being able to f you know formulate the ask yeah uh the ask may or may not be met with like i can satisfy that or you know your partner or somebody may say i can't fully satisfy that yeah. and then we have to realize that we have to do our own topping up yeah and um, we confront the wall of feeling not worthy i mm -hmm. i think if we leave a, a need unexpressed, yeah. uh, then we don't set ourselves up for disappointment mm. because there's a message of that we can't, we don't deserve it. Yeah. And we're always seeking to uh, reinforce and make true these negative messages. I think, I think the intention is to not kind of set ourselves up for that kind of pain and discomfort. Unfortunately, the pain and discomfort comes anyway because we can't avoid it because we're not dealing with the kind of challenge that's there yeah yeah you know i heard a great um quote which was um the less open you are with your heart to others the more that your heart will suffer in the long term oh my gosh i have had reason to look up this heartbreak manifesto by Bren brene brown mm. who really lauds the bravery of people who like you know better who to have loved and lost than never have loved at all and she really kind of champions this in this manifesto and it is true that heartbreak is one of the most painful things that we'll go through grief mm. heartbreak and loss yeah. uh but to go through that makes us a whole person mm. yeah yeah oh it's not easy recognizing your needs recognizing there's an unmet need calling mm. yourself out on the shitty behaviors where the the needs are leaking out yeah and 
turning those needs into constructive words as opposed to uh, unproductive behaviors. Yeah. Yeah. It's the path less traveled. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the final part of it really is around kind of responsibility for me Uh, as well. So like the, the next bit is how do I take responsibility for this? How do I take responsibility for what I'm feeling? How do I take responsibility for my emotions? How do I take responsibility for some of my actions? Um, and and how do I kind of turn those around to be something different? Because, you know, as I said before, it's not just about your partner kind of fixing you, making you better, making everything okay. You know, we've got to do some of this work internally to change some of the the story that's there some of the you know what what's the story train that I'm telling myself and Mm. actually is that an old story is that something from the past is it even true anymore Mm. you know got to be able to dispel some of the myths that we've created inside of our own mind and we you know that so the first stage is all about that recognition but then it's okay so so what then what happens now and it can be important at this stage to consider what happens if nothing changes then? What happens if I continue on this very same path oh. and I don't take responsibility and I don't do anything about it? Because we're always in choice and you can choose to be that way. But it's understanding what's the consequence, what's the cost, how, where, where does it get me in the long term or where does it not get me? What happens to your relationship? Yeah. Yeah. If nothing this were is, to I change. Talk- yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I was talking to a um, potential client the other day and, you know, similar sort of things coming up around kind of this conflict and this kind of stalemate situation. And, you know, my message was you've got to be able to deal with this now, because if you don't, then it will you will take it to the next relationship. If If it's not possible to save this relationship that you're in, if it's not possible to turn it around, you've still got to find some way of dealing with this, of understanding why this is coming up for you. Because, I mean, they say you don't, the universe will carry on presenting with the same learning until you get that shit together That's <laughs> and so understand the message and do something about it. Because it just keeps recurring and it comes back. It's like a little boomerang. You yeah. kind of toss it away and then, you know, two minutes later, it's back smacking you on the back of the head again. <laughs> Truer words were not yeah. spoken. <laughs> yeah. And just to feel those violent triggers, because you'll go into a new relationship and then you'll be massively triggered and be like, why is this coming up again? And it's like, because the fault was not with your ex-partner. The the call, as my lovely friend said, the call is coming from inside the house. Yeah. 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 Oh, food for thought. It's kind of triggering even talking about it in a good way. (laughs) Yeah. There's a great inside um, relationship reset. There's a whole section on kind of needs and wants and desires and kind of real kind of practical help to help to kind of unpick some of that. Because I think sometimes that's what we're missing, isn't it? Is that we know what the problem is or we can kind of, you know, we know and can identify this, this pattern that keeps coming up. But it's that real kind of practical assistance and that's why we do coaching isn't it is because on a one-to-one basis we can talk to people or you know in a couple's yeah. um, situation we can actually unpick some of that and we can get to the root of it sometimes yeah. if we're going to kind of work on some of this stuff on our own we do need that kind of extra help and guidance or something that's a bit more practical to help us to to work through these things yep you've got it we can see the pain points we can feel the pain but to yeah. link it with uh, untangling and a practical action. So are you going to link the relationship reset in our yeah. show notes? Yes. I certainly will, madame. Very good. <laughs> okay. Alrighty. Shall we take a question? Oh, yes. Let's go. Today's question. I kissed my friend and I'm not sure how it happened. I guess I've had feelings for quite a while, but I didn't know what had come over me. The thing is, I then panicked and ran away. We've not spoken since. How do I handle this? Okay. What's curious to me is why this kiss feels to be a problem or why it introduces complication and that hasn't been spoken, which is fine, but just kind of gets me curious is what is the forbidden fruit of this kiss? Mm -hmm. Do you think it's not though because in a friendship if you have got a really good friendship with somebody and then suddenly kind of something happens like that um 
is the fear not that that will then change that relationship forever so if the other person isn't interested and you've gone and kind of you know put yourself out on a limb there and then and they kind of say look I'm not interested in anything romantic then where does that leave the relationship so it's not a bit of kind of uncertainty trepidation a bit of kind of you know is it better to be friends with somebody than even if you've got kind of a little bit of a crush inside than not have them in your life at all is it not that and it could be and I think that's the leading and I think for the purpose of our podcast I think we should run with that the other things in my mind are I, I guess as I, when I, as I work with it as a physician what's curious to me is when people bring me a problem or a question Mm. The details left out are very illuminating. Mm. Uh, so, for example, in this con- uh, situation, it could be that the person that's asking the question or their friend is in a long-term relationship, partnership, or marriage, so that there's an infidelity piece to this. It could. <gasps> she went there. Right, of course. <laughs> um, but funny thing is they'll ask the question, but they won't actually offer the pertinent, the most pertinent mm. details out of shame and so forth. And I find yeah. sometimes I have to keep digging for that. Uh, yeah. The second thing is also uh, the friend, if they're of a uh, gender that doesn't conform with their believed sexual orientation, that can be quite mm. confusing. So I'll yeah. leave that again to the side. But, yeah. you know, I always, I think the first question would be, what is the forbidden f- fruit of this kiss? Is it, mm. is it ruining a friendship or putting that in peril? Is it because you're in a relationship? Is it because there's something about that sort of crossing the platonic barrier yeah. that is not uh, allowed for some reason mm. in your mind? Why does yeah. this, what, what is forbidden about this? But for the, just, that's just getting me curious. But for the purpose of this, let's, let's talk about crossing the friend barrier from platonic to non-platonic in a friendship and, um, I get the sense that, yes, let's, that sounds like the best, uh, course of action, uh, for the purpose of this question. <laughs> but you're right though, it could be any of those other reasons in terms of why this is causing a problem. Um, but I think specifically they have said about the friendship itself, as opposed to kind of anything else that's going on. So we don't really know, do we, what else might be kind of factoring into it. Um, so I think in terms of when we cross that line, you know, it's the same fear that we have in anything, really. A lot of the time it's that fear of rejection, isn't it? Fear that somebody isn't going to want the same things that we want. And therefore, what does that mean? Uh, what does that mean about me? What does that mean about the future? What does it mean about my happiness? Because um, we get totally emotionally sucked into kind of most life situations, really. You know, we're invested emotionally. We're emotional kind of creatures, even if we are... You know, we talk about being head and heart people. That doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you're head or heart or kind of, you know, a, a, a balance of the two. It still means that you get kind of emotionally invested in some shape or form. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we're not immune to it. People often kind of think, well, if you're like more of a head person or logical person, then you can't possibly get as attached to things and emotional about things. But it's just not simply not true, is it? It's not. And in fact, actually, what what is because when I work with clients who are very head focused, Mm. there is an emotional attachment, but they don't have words for it. Yeah. And it's very confusing. And so the inability to express express an emotional attachment Mm. is the thing that when I'm working with head people to be able to put words to those feelings and then words to be able to express those feelings can be like freeing somebody out of a prison. It's very, very true. It can be some of the most rewarding work that we do yeah. is helping people put words to their feelings when they're such head people. Yeah, absolutely. So where where would you, I mean, one of the things is, is this person asking the question is it's really important to, again, like we always do, dispel the shame and the guilt around, yeah. you know, what happened. And how would you help this person to reconcile any feeling, you know, because when are we we can never act through shame and guilt. That's never that's never our strong suit. In order to move forward, we have to, you know, sort of acknowledge and validate what's happened, why it's happened, and forgive ourselves for that if we have to, and then sort of move forward in uh, in strength and confidence. So, yeah. how would you help this person to unpack what happened? Yeah, I mean, I think it's that mindset when we have this kind of you know, guilty side or ashamed of of some behavior that we've done. Like there's a lot of kind of self-judgment there. And um, so we think, oh, it's I'm worried about what other people will think about me. 
But a lot of that stems from actually your own interpretation and of what that situation means. So if we, no one else can make us feel a certain way. So if we are comfortable with our choices and actions, it wouldn't actually matter then what anybody else said because we'd just be like, well, no, I'm perfectly fine with how I've behaved or what I've done or, you know, I don't see anything wrong with it. So so I think that's the first stage. And let's face it, you know, you kiss somebody. People kiss people every day. Yeah, true. <laughs> that's just how it works. Sometimes that's because they're in a relationship. Other times they're not. They're not. Um, and, you know, so these things happen. And so it's trying to kind of... Um, almost reduce some of the emphasis that is being placed on on the action on kind of what's happened and what I'd be more interested in moving towards is actually kind of what would you like to happen in the future what would you imagine um you know would happen next what is it that you were that you're hoping for what you know almost kind of what what led to this position because there's something that led to it and there's a kind of secret desire or a secret kind of future outcome that this person is probably thinking about and I think it's really important just to get that out in the open and to understand that because often when we say things out loud then we can start to make sense of them ourselves but also it can take some of the energy some of the heat out of it and then we can start to kind of break it you know break it down but the this fear of kind of rejection is the stuff that holds us back from telling people how we feel particularly when we don't know how they feel you know, realistically, what what does it matter if they say I'm not interested? It doesn't make you any less of a person. You're still a great person. You know, you're still amazing. And if that person isn't attracted to you or doesn't kind of desire a relationship with you, that's okay too. Because, you know, we're, we're made up of a world where we can have choice and we can kind of pick and choose who we want to have a relationship with. And, and it's okay if somebody doesn't want to have a relationship with you. It's true, and it doesn't invalidate your feelings for them. No. They're just as beautiful. Yeah. The fact that you can care for somebody, love somebody, uh, cross over, you know, have a, have romantic feelings for somebody, it's, it's, it's ultimately a beautiful thing, and it does not require somebody else to approve of your feelings. Yeah. Yeah. They exist without approval. Yeah. Yeah. So then from that standpoint, then, how would you recommend them starting to communicate whether or not they, well, you know, initiating a communication or an invitation to communicate about what happened. Yeah, so I think the, the longer you leave it, the worse it's going to get is what I would say to you. Um, I had a phone call from somebody today who had not been in touch for ages. I've been trying to track them down. <laughs> uh-huh. And, um, and, and, and the, you know, they basically said, like, look, I know it's been weeks now and I, and I just felt a bit embarrassed to ring back because I hadn't spoken to you until this point. It's like never be embarrassed, like at no stage, just kind of because I was actually concerned that there was something wrong and wanted to kind of really understand kind of, um, you know, the reason why. And and that was all that was important to me. So there's no judgment there. There's nothing. Um, so I think sometimes we have to move beyond that because the longer we leave it, the more the embarrassment's going to grow, the more the kind of self judgment's going to grow. Um, often we kind of don't want to face up to things, but you know, just imagine if you were going to be an adult, what would you, what would you do? Oh. Because, you know, with that avoidance and that kind of hiding in the cupboard, do you ever tell you a story about when I was a chambermaid? No, God. <laughs> oh my God. No. So I was once a chambermaid, I was very young. Um, I was, uh, I had a lot of jobs. I had uh, not a lot of money and a lot of jobs <laughs> to try and kind of uh, make ends meet. And one of them was chambermaid. And I was a rubbish chambermaid, I have to say. <laughs> Oh my and gosh. Uh, so you always had kind of your list of rooms that you had to to work on and um so I kind of you know as a chambermaid knock on the door you'd wait if you didn't hear anything you'd go in um so I went in and caught two people in the middle of sex oh my god <laughs> oh wow and because I was so young I was so embarrassed um I immediately just shut the door ran to the other side of the hotel I can't even believe I'm admitting as if they were podcast. chasing you yeah yeah, yeah right yep. and then hid in a wardrobe in a completely different room like why did I do that what was I thinking of oh this is so wonderful oh my gosh so then of course after a few seconds I realized 
that my behavior was ridiculous. I came out of the wardrobe and I kind of just owned my embarrassment and I carried on doing my job, which is what I was there to do. Um, so we do, we do stupid things like that, like hiding in wardrobes, um, which are unnecessary. And we just need to kind of be the adult, be the grown up and, uh, just face some of these situations. Oh. Face your embarrassment. Oh my gosh, that is just an amazing story. It's so true. <laughs> Hiding in the in the cupboard or the wardrobe, like figuratively or literally or both. Yeah, exactly. Oh. But that's what it is, right? So we just wow. kind of want to hide in a wardrobe. Um, so so that's the first thing I would say. Like, just don't leave it any longer. Just really, I, I would kind of spend some time understanding kind of what it is you 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 would want um you know what would be an ideal outcome and just really kind of um work through that and then you've got something to kind of go back with haven't you and and i think it's just a kind of you, you know you start the conversation by you know asking t- to talk is the kind of some time some space that we can have a conversation whether that's face to face i wouldn't advise if you can help it doing over a text message but if that's the only way that you can communicate then do it i'm a big advocate f- for that like you know find any possible means to communicate as opposed to none because uh, the, you know the alternative is always going to be a better option but ideally just kind of meet up face to face have some things kind of pre planned in your mind that you want to say because having that opening position it's a bit like when they say when you get on stage and you do a presentation like get your first two lines off pat so you know exactly what you're going to say you know how you're going to stand you kind of feel really confident in those first few kind of minutes and then after that the rest will flow because your nervous system you'll kind of remember that you have to breathe and kind of that works really well in most situations I've found (laughs) um you know so your nervous system will then start to calm down you'll get more confidence and you'll be able to deal with anything that comes up and you know the same thing goes when we're dealing with some of these kind of more trickier conversations with people is if we can kind of get those first few lines really get that opening position which you know would probably be something along the lines of um you know oh you know I you know should probably say that I, I wish I'd faced up to this a bit sooner or you know something like that just acknowledging where you're at acknowledging the situation acknowledge the fact that you had a case um and then just ask them how do they feel about it totally and they might say it was wonderful I'm so pleased that you did that and yeah. I didn't know how to react because you then kind of disappeared and I haven't we we haven't seen each other since that could be one outcome one outcome could be well, I was a bit surprised. I was a bit taken back. It wasn't kind of what I was expecting. We're friends. So that kind of, you know, could could draw a line under that. Or you could get met with a similar sort of confusion. Like, you know, it was nice, but I feel a bit confused now about where we're at. Any of those three options or any other permutation of, of um, discussion that comes back gives you something to move forward with as opposed to, at the minute, you're trapped in the wardrobe. <laughs> yeah, trapped in your own head terrified to come out totally oh that's incredible that's moving forward like an improv scene I saw a fantastic improv actor when I was in uh, Athens and she was uh, performing with her crew and just reminded me about the beauty of improv which is Mm. you cannot act in a vacuum you need Mm. inputs from others and once they throw you uh, a, a new sort of you know, uh, idea or uh, scene, then you can take the next step forward. Yeah. So absolutely have the conversation, yeah. get out of your head. Yeah. Yeah. And don't think kind of too many steps ahead. Just focus on getting that first bit out and then asking them, what do they think? Because guaranteed they will surprise you. You will yeah. not be able to predict what they'll say. Yeah. And it's one of the beautiful things about coaching that I love is, um, you know, and there's, there's the philosophy, isn't there? Like everyone's a student, everyone's a teacher because none of us know what the other person's going to say or how they're going to react. And I love it in a coaching session when I'm imagining a client's going to come back in a certain way and they come back with something completely different. And I'm like, whoa, okay. I was not expecting that. Yeah. And it, you know, just demonstrates how little we know about other people because we judge the thoughts and interactions and the things that happen based on our own internal compass. Right. That's nice. I wish I had had that advice years ago when I've had these (laughs) awkward kisses with friends. Would have saved me a lot of uh, heartache. (laughs) Because we've all been there. We continue to be there. 
that is the thing, right? I just think we've all been there in whether it's not that exact situation, we've all been in, in an embarrassing situation that we then kind of, you know, don't know how to get out of. So, but the the best thing I think, and, and this really comes from kind of being on the mature side, <laughs> is just facing up to shit that comes our way because there really is no other way around it. Yeah, you've got it. Oh, well, I kind of oh. hope a stranger would kiss me now. I'm kind of like, uh, or a friend would <laughs> kind of feel really prepared for this. <laughs> yeah, any friends out there that want to um, snog Anna, she's freely available. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep, you've got it. She'll have our response ready. <laughs> you've got it. You've got it. <laughs> snog away, everybody. Snog away. Snog Open away. for snogging. It's snogging season. <laughs> <laughs> Except maybe while my when my voice returns and I'm not so infectious. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say I'm sure there's a public health message in there somewhere. But... You've got it. You've got it. <laughs> I can always be counted on to turn it to public health. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, we are very grateful that your voice has held out. Indeed, for the husky hour. Well, and I've talked a bit less, which is kind of relieving to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh gosh. <laughs> Oh, well, we shall let you go and rest your voice and uh, I'll see you until next time. Until next time. So that's it for another week of Geordie Lass and Doc Sass. We hope you've enjoyed listening as much as we've enjoyed chatting. Get in touch and share your questions for relationship remedies and any hot topics you want us to cover. If you need help navigating all things relationships, Anna and Sarah are available for one-on-one coaching support. Email info at geordielass.com. Please remember to like, share, subscribe if you've enjoyed listening. And if you've not, how on earth have you made it this far? I promise we'll try harder next time.